was a better person than I knew I was. Hey, folks, let's spend some time with friends up north. Pat Kreitlow of Up North News is on Lake Wissota. Sarah Yacoub of the Manaqua Brewing Company Super Pack is on the Mississippi River. And up on Lake Manaqua is Kirk Bangstead of the Manaqua Brewing Company. Wherever you are, welcome. You're up north. Won't you let me die? Hey, hey, hey. Hello, everyone. Welcome. welcome. Podcast. I'm Kirk Bankstead. I'm Sarah Yacoub. And I'm Pat Wrightlow. On the show this week, authoritarianism is on the march. The state Supreme Court adopts a new decade of rigged maps. Wausau conservatives got on the school board and are already talking about banning books. And Marathon County, the county board there, has solved racism by abolishing its diversity task force because that's that makes racism <laughs> go away, right? Kirk, we need some good news. Uh, well, well, Pat, so on the plus side, we're going to talk about a lot about this gerrymandering decision uh, in the show today. But uh, before we do that, uh, uh, we had a really great piece of news uh, that the, so the court case against Marjorie Taylor Greene, which is uh, tr trying to remove her from the ballot for aiding and abetting the uh, insurrection on January 6th, which the, the disqualification clause in the 14th Amendment says you can't do that and and run for office. That was allowed to go forward uh, in uh, by a, by a federal judge in Georgia, and so that means that our case against Ron Johnson, Tom Tiffany, and uh, Scott Fitzgerald uh, is looking like uh, you know that it, it, it bodes well because it means there's now precedent for allowing these cases to proceed. So that's some good news, Pat. Um, we'll take but, that. We'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Little victories. But let's we're going to talk about. Let's talk about this gerrymandering decision. So, um, first of all, uh, you know the maps that the uh, Republicans uh, put out in the legislature were accepted finally by the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Uh, this reverses its own previous ruling and adopts the maps written by, you know, reverses its own previous rulings. So we're going to talk more about this in a few minutes with the plaintiff in the now famous Supreme Court case about the 2011 gerrymandering, but. At the important thing I want to note here is that the Supreme Court now uh, probably can be considered more of a partisan political body than a, an actual uh, a, a bunch of a bunch of a uh, bunch of judges. So that's I think that's what we're going to get to it in the course of this show. What do you think? Yeah, I, I I I don't doubt that for a bit. But you know, to me the the impression I get is there's a real schoolhouse rock moment in this. Sarah, do you know? how how a veto is it, how they how the legislature can override a veto with two-thirds of the majority two-thirds of the majority and if they can't do that the bill dies right Absolutely. well you're wrong sarah you're oh wrong. yeah you're no wrong because we are in to override a veto <laughs> you don't need two-thirds of the legislature you just need some buddies on the state supreme court we have never <laughs> seen something like this where a court instead of trying to find you know, some kind of middle ground, common ground, anything, blatantly takes the thing that has been vetoed and could not get overridden and says, nah, we're going to go with that. So if, if nothing tells you what uh, kind of a, a partisan organization uh, the Wisconsin Supreme Court has become, I, I, I just don't know what will. Well, well, Pat, we're going to get into it uh, from start to uh, finish. Um, yeah, with, I'm, uh, I'm looking. For, I'm really glad that you got Bill Woodford in here because, uh, you know, again, he's his, his name is on the case that that got this all started, and I really want to hear what he thinks about something as, as as basic as how the right wing justices picked the Republican map because they claimed that it was the only one that was race neutral compared to all the other submissions that tried to take into account racial disparities in the past. In other words something we're hearing a lot more of lately, attempting to address or even recognize racism is being attacked as, as, as racist. You, you just, you can't make this stuff up. So when we come back, Bill Woodford about the U.S. Supreme Court case that locked in Wisconsin's rigged maps uh, right after this. You're up north. All right, 
So Welcome I just back. wanted to uh, put on Sarah. I just wanted to play that song because it was it's uh, by Lincoln Park and it's all about shame and and making terrible mistakes, which I thought was a pretty good intro to uh, to talking about this last uh, uh, decision by the Wisconsin Supreme Court. So take it away, Sarah. Thank you, Kirk, for your uh, stupendous uh, musical selection, as always. Uh, welcome back to the Up North podcast. The case Gill v. Whitford isn't well known, which is really a shame because it's the Wisconsin case that showed the true partisan stripes of conservatives on the United States Supreme Court. It is the case that locked in the 2011 rigged maps drawn by Republicans right after they and Scott Walker took control of state government. We are about to talk to the Whitford in Gil v. Whitford. He is Professor Emeritus Bill Whitford, who joined the University of Wisconsin Law School in 1965 and taught a wide range of business law subjects, but he's now known in the legal history books as being part of a group of Wisconsin residents who challenged the GOP's 2011 redistricting plan as an unconstitutional partisan gerrymander. The case showed promise until the conservatives on the Supreme Court win all Sergeant Schultz on us. You know, I see nothing telling democracy, nothing to, to see here at all, Kirk. So Whitford originally won the case and the ruling was the first time in over three decades that a federal court invalidated a redistricting plan for partisan bias. So this this was great. It got overturned by the Supreme Court. So Bill, can, I just we just kind of laid, laid the scene, but you've been a part of this fight for fair maps for the last 12 years. So thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So, so we just introduced this case. Uh, we talked about it being overturned on appeal. Um, can you take it from there? I want, I mean, you, you, you've lived this history, uh, your law professor, can you kind of take it from there and tell and lay the scene for all of our listeners on, on after you, after you guys sued for gerrymandering in 2011, and it was a it was overturned. You won, and it was overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court. What happened after that? Let's start with Evers being elected. Yeah, the, the uh, you know we we hoped, of course, to throw out the 2011 gerrymander. Which I even wrote a op-ed just talking about why Wisconsin was not a legislative democracy, which I really believe. But when Evers got elected in 2018, we had hopes that well, although we couldn't overturn the 2011 gerrymander. When the 2020 census came in, and there was a, the Evers would be able to veto the next gerrymander, and it would go to the courts. The history is that when it goes to the courts, although you may not get, you may get a, a districting scheme that has some partisan bias. The, the partisan biases of judicially made maps are usually modest, and certainly much more modest than the 2011 redistricting. So what, what happened for our listeners out there uh, who aren't living and breathing this stuff? What happened instead when the uh, courts got involved this time around? Well, uh, it ended up being a comedy of errors, but the result, as we all know, as a result of the decision of the Wisconsin Supreme Court last Friday, is that they basically, the judges enacted the legislature's 2021 redistricting, which was even slightly more biased than the 2011 redistricting, which was the one of the top five state legislative redistrictings in terms of degree of partisan bias in modern history. Uh, now, how did that happen? It was a kind of comedy of errors, as it turns out. But it began with the state Supreme Court first saying, well, they would take jurisdiction uh, over redrawing the map, drawing the maps when the legislature and the governor couldn't agree. And that's and something would, brand that's something brand new, Bill. That that um, you know, for decades it's been federal courts that that did that. Mostly federal courts. Mostly federal. I mean, the, mostly federal, and certainly in Wisconsin, always federal. But right, right. Back in 1964, but, the the state justices said this is. This is not in our bailiwick. This is not our area That's of right. That's right. And, and of course, it was unwise for them to take jurisdiction, but they, it, the unwise was doubled because they took jurisdiction and they took it as an original case in the Supreme Court. What was unfortunate about that is that the state Supreme Court has no capacity to conduct a trial, cross, allow cross-examination of witnesses, make what we call findings of fact. 
So they had to devise a procedure to come to a result uh, that didn't have a trial, which in a federal court you would have. Uh, they set themselves up more or less as a super legislature. And that was the concept. And it's very clear. We all know that Justice Hagedorn basically controls the Supreme Court. Whatever he decides, he'll get three people to join him. If you read his opinion, uh, when he first adopted Evers maps six weeks ago or so, uh, it's clear that's how he's setting himself up. And the reason but underlying all this is the fact that the Voting Rights Act of 65, 1965, does require some findings of fact uh, when you create majority minority districts, or in Wisconsin, those are mostly black majority districts in Milwaukee. And so Hagedorn's idea was, well, you will adopt a map, and if people want to challenge it, they can bring a different case which is exactly what they would have to do if the legislature adopted it and the governor signed it. But then the U.S. Supreme Court pulled a fast one on him. They said, no, you can't do it that way, Justice Hagedorn. You've got to make findings of fact and send it back to the state Supreme Court. Well, the Supreme Court can't make findings of fact. And so Hagedorn was kind of caught. Now, I, I give Hagedorn some credit for trying to do the right thing. I don't always agree with him, but try, he tries. Uh, and he was kind of caught because by taking jurisdiction to the state Supreme Court, they just assumed that they could do this without making findings of fact. And, and the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court said, you can't. You got to make findings of fact. So he's tried to figure out rationaling. In that context, he's saying the best situation is just to adopt the legislature's plan without going into more. Well, that. well, that would be so, that would be fine if if the number of majority minority dis minority majority districts say stayed the same. But you had the U.S. Supreme Court specifically cite the fact that the Evers maps added from six to seven uh, the number of minority majority districts. Now they said you you can't do that you know, for, for well, but under their opinion, Pat. If I can interrupt, yeah, you needed do. to make findings, whatever, uh, however many black majority districts you created. Now the legislature created five, but they said they didn't consider race. It was just an accident. They drew <laughs> the lines ignoring race, and that's the thing that Hagedorn leveled on. You know, the U.S. Supreme Court decision was very unfortunate, I think almost all commentators would say. It was done on the so-called shadow docket. It was done very quickly. It was done without the benefit of full briefing. It was done without any oral argument. I, I can, and done within two weeks, 5-4, Justice Roberts dissented. And I'm on the procedure. You don't make decisions of first impact, there'd never been a case quite like this, that can set a precedent without, if you're the US Supreme Court, without a lot of deliberation. Unless I'm, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop you, Bill. I wanna repeat, I wanna repeat what you said because you said a lot of legal stuff that, that I don't understand. But what I, I got was a shadow docket is something that the Supreme Court does when like if if they don't have hearings if they don't do the regular process of getting two sides to like argue and they don't wow. sign the, uh, the opinion on stuff, that's called a shadow docket. And it's, and it's, it's just kind of an abbreviated way process that is, that doesn't really, doesn't really instill a lot of confidence in the decision from the American oh, people. And it's used for emergencies. I mean, supposing you had somebody scheduled to be executed and there was a question of whether it was constitutional to execute it. Well, you use the shadow docket to say, don't execute him now until we can consider whether he has a constitutional claim. It's, it's, it's used for emergencies like that. Professor, uh, so they did this. Yep, go for it, sir. Well, okay. So uh, relatively young attorney here, former deputy district attorney. I do pro bono nonprofit law now. Um, is this normal? Because I feel like a kid and take your kids out of the room here, but with Santa Claus, you know, I practice law. I love the practice of law, but there was always this sort of good faith underlying that 
facts and law matter, that the political nonsense that we see, perhaps with the legislature, didn't necessarily taint our judicial branch. And, you know, for the first time in my adult life, that does not seem to be the case. Has this happened other times in history? Uh, Are you yeah, you're being a little this? bit, uh, you're being a little idealistic, Sarah, probably more than you really believe. Sure. But, you know, for the U.S. Supreme Court, I mean, it's the highest court in the land, and they make a precedent that applies to the whole country. They should be deliberate. So I'm very critical of them. Even if you think Hagedorn's scheme about how we were going to come up was a little harebrained. Hey, let his apportionment apply for one election. You can decide the U.S. Supreme Court and whether it's appropriate. But there's never been a case like this in the U.S. Supreme Court. It was done in two weeks without a 5-4. So that, I'm very critical of them. But of course, the original sin was the state Supreme Court, as we talked earlier, taking the case and taking it without a trial procedure. What's called so, the that was the original sin that got them into this trouble. So, Bill, um, you mentioned I, I got two more questions. One is uh, you you mentioned that some of the some of the reasoning, especially with uh, Judge uh, Judge Bradley went beyond the confines of what you say, the canon yeah. of law. Uh, yeah, and I well, want you to explain that. three conservative justices. Early. Those three conservative justices, uh, Rogensack, uh, Ziegler, and especially Rebecca Grassley Bradley, if you read all their elections cases, including this redistricting case and including the Trump challenges to the results in 2021, I mean, their opinions are outside the ordinary canon of where you talk about legal precedents and exceptions and legal reasoning, and you're sort of talking to future lawyers. You read those opinions, they're speaking to a crowd, and they're speaking to a crowd of, we'll say, MAGA people or something like that. I mean, in Rebecca Grassley Bradley's concurrence in the decision last Friday, she goes after what Donald Trump would call the lamestream media for how they're reporting on their decisions. I mean, it's not considered unbecoming for a judge to say anything about that, but you certainly don't say anything about that in the middle of an opinion. I think Sarah would agree with me with that. Though those justices so, are just outside, they're outside out of bounds. So I, I, I agree with you, um, but you know, it's coming coming from a retired law professor who's been in this for um, you know, since nineteen sixty five, that weighs a lot more than you know, a guy that's, you know, fighting for progressive stuff right now. So anybody you, makes a good craft beer deserves a lot of credit. For there you go. Thanks, there man. Go. But but let me but let me ask, I mean, you've been doing this since 1965. You've been a law professor in Wisconsin. You've been deeply, you know, you've been, you know, deeply versed in what's been happening with the Wisconsin Supreme Court since since you kind of be, came to the scene from Yale and wherever all the other high, high ivory towers you came from. As, well, University of Wisconsin, you, Madison. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, can you tell us, like, is this, is this maybe the most partisan Supreme Court you've ever witnessed in, in your 60 years of well, thinking about it? Well, because of Hagedorn, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that about the whole Supreme Court, because I say, you know, Justice Hagedorn, the other six justices, you could just forget whatever he's decided, he's going to get three votes and it'll be a 4-3 decision. Uh, when we're going to get one, the liberals or the conservatives. And Hagedorn, I think, is trying to be a principal justice. I don't always agree with him, but he's trying. And he's writing legal opinions. So I, I so if you take the court as a whole, I don't, I can't agree with you, Cook, but I will say for those three justices, I mean, they're, they're, they're all women, so I can't call them wild men. Wild women. They're wild women. They're, they're they are, wild in the it's case. It's not of, just theirs. It's yeah. not just that that opinion. If you like, you just said, and I want to I want to uh, underscore this for the audience. If you read some of the other things that they have said in their in their opinions, and frankly, in their oral arguments as well, it's very clear that we're dealing with with uh, true politicians on the court, which does not serve us well in in any way shape or form uh bill woodford we really appreciated your your insight um your experience on this thank you so much for joining us this evening thank you for having me all right when we come back we're going to turn our attention 
to book banning, the kind of thing seen in authoritarian regimes, which is a lot easier to have when voters can't get a fair ballot to choose their leaders. The latest from Wausau after this. You're up north. Won't you let me die? Folks, welcome back to the cabin. This is the Up North podcast where I don't pick the songs. I'm Pat Kreitlow, along with Sherry Akub and DJ Kurt Bangstead, uh, who wants to explain the song choice has nothing to do with, it's not like Dr. Ruth Westheimer is our next guest. That's that's not where you're going with this at all, Kurt. No, I picked Let's Talk About Sex by Salt and Peppa from the days when I was, I think, in high school, uh, because we're going to have an awesome guest uh, in uh, who is just unseated in the Wausau School Board by a group called the Wisconsin Family Council who wants to ban sex education in school among so many other things that are that are backwards. So I just kind of wanted to say, let's talk about sex is, is a way to kind of poke the bear a little bit, which, you know, I, I kind of love to do. So not you, but without no. further ado, <laughs> Sarah, Sarah, kind of give us a background on what's going on here, please. Absolutely. We have the pleasure of speaking in a moment with Jane Rush, a retired corrections officer whose reasons for serving on the Wausau School Board were simple. She wanted to give back to the community that gave so much to her. She was on the board for the last 15 years, one of, if not the longest serving member. She attended education conferences, conventions, and read books and articles about how to best educate children. But she lost her seat in the election a few weeks ago after conservative donors inside and beyond Wausau flooded the local school board race with cash and extremely political campaign ads that ended with a right-wing takeover of the board. And, well, to almost no one's surprise, it's already leading to talk of books being banned. Thanks for being on the show, Jane. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Glad to be here. All right. So, uh, Jane, the first question is this group, that kind of seemingly organized and uh, helped you know, kind of uh, get you out of the Supreme, uh, of the, the Supreme Court, out of the school board uh, with, is the Wisconsin Family Council. Can you, can you talk about who they are and what they stand for? Well, they started as a group to get corporal punishment back in schools, oh, to great. ban sex education, <laughs> yeah. um, and just basically for the right wing to take over the school boards. And on the Wassa School Board, is one of their board members, Lee Webster. And he, as soon as this election was over, he was off and running and put these four books up to be um, exchanged for other books with no reason other than it caused controversy in a couple other districts, which is why this isn't actually book banning. It is because with book banning, the entire board and the person putting the book forward to be banned have to read the book in their entirety and then say why they want this book to be banned. And they didn't have to do any of that. These books weren't even looked at. It was just what these other districts said. Mostly Williamson County um, School District in Tennessee was where most of the information came from. Oh, well, I mean, God, if we're going to let a county in Tennessee, you know, dictate education policy in Wisconsin, I mean, sign me up for, you know, how to make moonshine 101. Uh, my apologies to <laughs> good people of Tennessee. Um, let's talk a bit more about these these four books. We don't, I, I don't know the extent of detail you want to get into about it, but I mean, to what degree do they deal with either, is it about sex and gender? Is it about race? Is it about other things? What, what, what's been at the, what are the topics of these four books as far as you can see? Hatchet is mostly because it mentions divorce and heaven forbid we cannot have kids learn that there's divorce out there in oh, fourth grade. <laughs> the other three are more about race and not wanting kids to learn about some of our bad practices we've had in our history. You know, we want to whitewash our history and make it all look glossy and happy and 
Lord forbid it, we um, Wait, let our kids it... learn. The truth. So Jane, you sent me you sent me an article about this. Is one of them like this Martin Luther King picture picture book? That book hasn't been yet, um, and I think a lot of these are going to go under the radar. The four books um, are all for fourth grade so far: are Hatchet, George versus George, which is about the American Revolution and King George and George Washington seeing the revolution from both sides and it talks about um, how blacks were treated and we don't like to hear negative things there because if you ignore race it goes away um, <laughs> and the other <laughs> the other two books were walk two moons which is about native americans and the horrific things that we've done to them come into play it's not about the whole book but it comes into play and we don't want kids to learn that and they talk in that one about Mount Rushmore about how upsetting it was to the Native Americans to have four white men carved on that mountain when it was a Native American religious place and then the other one was Woods Runner and they just talk about it's too graphic and it's it's too upsetting for children. So maybe maybe we should talk about it from not so much the incendiary part of it which is you know obvious of course but the the response I imagine where we should go next is about fourth graders, because you talked about that this is the level that we're talking about here. And again, as Sarah explained, you do your homework as a school board member. Yeah, you, you don't, you know, uh, shoot from the hip. You have to weigh, you know, what is appropriate, what is not. But that doesn't just mean saying that everything is inappropriate because you're only fourth grade. Fourth grade at some point you know, I, I certainly know my parents were going through divorce at that point. Um, so what are your thoughts on the, the, the fourth grade level that's being discussed here for these for these topics that, you know, children of that age can't be hidden from? Well, these kids are living the divorce thing. Most of them know kids that have divorced parents or are living through it themselves or have lived through it or are kind of hoping that they can live through it if they're living in a, in a precarious household. And as for the other books, it's just, you know, books are there for a reason and it helps kids to know what's going on in life. It helps prepare them for life. And the reason these books were chosen, were chosen because they're at the fourth grade re reading level and they offer a variety for the students and some of it is historical fiction, some of it's fiction, and they trying to make it a well-balanced program. And then we came in as a Wasa School District and made it unbalanced because it made some adults uncomfortable. Okay, so a couple things. <laughs> One, thank you so much for sharing all this and bringing this much needed conversation. Um, I'm the mother of a fourth grader and he has divorced parents. And he's asked me and he's expressed hardship about feeling left out or that are feeling like he can't say hi to me with his dad or his dad with me because he's embarrassed that we're divorced and giving him the understanding that you're not alone and our family is different, but we love you and we're still a family. So depriving kids of the ability to understand and empathize what modern families look like is just cruel. And as you're saying these books, I'm ordering them from him. The second thing is, Uncle Tom's Cabin for me was so eye-opening and just mm -hmm. really sort of expanded not only my empathy, but just my desire to learn. Um, and so this idea that we're not going to challenge our kids to think or self-examine or ask good questions, I mean, isn't that the point of school to make them free-thinking individuals? I, it, it's just astounding. I find these far-right far groups to live, they live with blinders on. They live in an America that never was and never will be. And during our last round of going through our sex education program, uh, Mr. Webster was adamant that we talk to kids that about marriage being a man and a woman and not to discuss divorce at all. So they just wanna live in a world where they don't believe any of the stuff happens. And if we don't talk about it, it's not there. Okay, let me come back. I think I love this conversation, but it just, I mean, it's occurring to me that school boards 
Like, it's not, not their job to figure out which books, you know, kids are supposed to read. Like, it's their job to find an awesome superintendent uh, who then hires awesome principals, who then hires awesome teachers who have, you know, gone to the, you know, Department of Public Instruction conferences about what's the best curricula to teach their children. It's not the realm of people who aren't in education, who haven't gotten PhDs or master's degrees in education, to be talking about what kids should be should or should not be learning. Am I correct exactly. here? Yes. A, a board's job is to set policy. And this book process was all vetted. There was a group of teachers and administrators, and they sat and looked at different programs and vetted them, and then came to the board for the approval. And the board decided on their own that they were going to become part of vetting program. There was a reason that no board members were seated on that vetting committee, because that's not our job. So but. this this takes us then. So we've moved us from the curricula curriculum level to the school board level. So let's take this a step higher to the community level. While we can say, you know, that this should not be the, the, the place of a school board. Again, I feel like I'm being way too fair here, but uh, I, I will for the sake of argument is that people can say, well, um, you know, the school board is elected by the community. Uh, our person got the most votes. And so clearly they must speak for the majority of the community, no matter what the majority of the community wants. That is, that does that is democracy, yes, but that is hardly best practices when it comes to whether a, a school board or anything, a city council, a county board, whatnot, um, you know, just because a majority of voters think it should be operated like a theocracy, you know, does not make it the right way to go. But it does underscore, Jane, that, you know, the thing that you and I, or actually everybody here has gone through an election and lost. And that is that whole notion of trying to get the word out to people that these things matter. The, the school board races matter. It's not just Biden versus Trump. And what, what are your own thoughts on that at the, at the community school board election level when you're trying to convey all this to voters who might back you but just don't think about getting involved in voting in these kinds, kinds of things? Well, it's really difficult when so much, so much money was flooded into this race. In my first five elections, I probably spent $400 in all of those elections combined. And in this one, I took some um, in-kind donations that are going to be about $3,000. And it's just, it's just heartbreaking because they have a radio station here in town that oh, the host oh, has called me a, yeah. all kinds of names. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they have access they ran ads and i don't know how to get people to vote <laughs> hopefully they'll sit back and watch the next year and get out and vote next time i know well, this not, year the vote was down in my neighborhood well you know if you're hearing negative i mean negative ads the whole point of negative ads is to decrease decrease turnout and get everybody disgusted so that the people who um, who, are, who are just hell bent on, you know, overturning are the only ones that are actually going to be voting. So that's, that's always what negative ads do. But it, but, you know, in, uh, it's not like I've been looking at election history in Wisconsin for that long, but it seems like this last one at the local level, uh, we've been hearing like the turnout was really high uh, for school boards and county boards. And that's just not that normal in Wisconsin. No, and, and but hate is a good motivator. Oh, it sure is. And I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, this kind of comes back to something we talked about earlier, and that is the whole reason the state Supreme Court is messed up the way it is, is because a couple of years back when Brian Hagedorn was on the ballot, he was way behind in the polls, way behind when it was, you know, when it was shown that he was uh, instrumental in starting a school, a private school that actively discriminated against same-sex parents. Um, and so he was way behind to the point where voters got cocky, they got confident, they got complacent, mm -hmm. whatever it is. And Hagedorn squeaked out a narrow victory, as opposed to right now, we would have a, a progressive majority on there. So um, 
you know, it just goes to, to again, underscore that these things we didn't normally pay attention to so much, state Supreme Court elections, school board elections, things like that, they do matter. They will matter now from now till, you know, our, our time is gone. They will, we are not going back to the sleepy elections that, uh, that, that we once had. So what I wanted to ask you, though, is we can't wait till the next election. Do you feel like there, this is a board now that will be in any way responsive to public comment, either at meetings or otherwise? Absolutely not. They claim they want it to be open and transparent. This is not a transparent process that they just went through. They claim that they will listen to all voters and they made it very clear when they were running that they would not. <laughs> they will listen to the people that voted to them. But that doesn't mean people should stay home and not speak up. You know, they need to get out there. Well and said. I have to tell you, I just got a message that Hatchet is being read in one of our parochial schools by the fourth grade. They just started it today. <laughs> All right, we'll take it. <laughs> you know, I've often heard better is the enemy of good. And, you know, by no mm -hmm. means is the Democratic Party perfect. But it seems like, you know, among voters, because there's an expectation of something that isn't getting done, or maybe something isn't ideal, we use that to be disheartened and stay home, as opposed to, you know, cutting our losses and, you know, it's never going to be perfect one way or the other, but recognizing we need to get in this game and we need to fight because there is a movement in Wisconsin that is really scary right now. What advice do you have for our listeners to get in there and fight? Get involved. You know, get involved with your local Democratic Party. Get out and knock doors when they ask you to, even though it's a really difficult thing to do for some people. You know, talk to your friends. Don't make politics a taboo subject. That's how they back us into these corners. It sure is. They, they put you on, on defense. People don't want to get involved. They don't want to rock the boat. And the fact of the matter is, if, if you don't, these kinds of things happen. Jane Rush, thank you so much. We, we loved visiting with you. Wish you all the best and uh, look forward to talking again soon. Okay, anytime. All right, we'll wrap up the show after this. You're up north. Alabama's got me so upset. Tennessee made me lose my rest. And everybody knows about Mississippi. God damn. Alabama's Welcome back to the cabin. So as we do each week, we want to thank our hosts. After all, you might hear this show as a podcast because you're not in the areas of these radio stations. But if you ever are, you should definitely tune in to Devil Radio 92.7 in the Madison area or in the Waukesha, Milwaukee area. Find us on WAUK 540 AM and the Shaw 101.1 .1 FM. You can use their Devil Radio app to listen to our show anytime on demand. And you can find the video version on the Facebook page of the Monaco Brewing Company. Also, you can find my daily work over at upnorthnewswi.com or search Up North News WI on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can catch our new Up North News daily updates on these fine radio stations at 7.30 weekday mornings and 5.30 in the evenings and other times as well. And as if that weren't enough, you two, this week, I started doing a daily update on TikTok. Um, I do Whoa, not dance. Pat. I will never dance, but I do give anyone who wants it a daily dose of three things to know about Wisconsin news in under 60 seconds. So yeah, the news is moving to TikTok because that's the way the world works. What do you think, Kirk? You want to get on there? Maybe we'll... Do, we'll, we'll... No, I, I can't. Everyone says I'm too long-winded, Pat. I, I write Facebook posts and people either read them or skim them, but I can't do anything slow, like less long than like a five minute read i just can't my brain doesn't work that way i can't lay it out I can't i can't do the intro i can't do the middle guts and i can't do the end without a five minute read i just doesn't doesn't work for me man that's uh, what I, dancing's for to music it's tiktok now now wait you got the fourth grader you're the one with with kids at home right now is, is tiktok uh much of a I, I i'm old dog new tricks so i'm not the cool mom i have them on like Khan academy although i i did spring for the harry potter puzzle game which is really fun if anyone wants a good mindless puzzle <laughs> I, I i gotta say when i'm when i'm looking at tiktok or when i'm looking at instagram reels um i i've never felt so old because we had 
something called parents back in the day who were like, no, you can't watch this channel. No, you can't watch that show. Um, but on, on TikTok and, and reels, as you shuffle through, I mean, you don't know what you're going to see next and it's, it's an education. So th this is, this is grandpa here. And, uh, <laughs> having just had my, having my fourth grand, I'm now the grandfather of four. Um, I can say this as a grandfather, don't give your kids a blank check on these things. Know what they're looking at. Look over their shoulder, take control of the device or what have you. Um, because that you're you're doing you're doing them a favor. Um, I wanted to close uh, in, in part, kind of the way we began in talking about authoritarianism on the march here, just to note that uh, we've been following the Marathon County Board for a couple of years now, trying to do the most basic decent thing in the wake of the George Floyd murder at the hands of Minneapolis police, and that was to simply pass a resolution saying hate has no place in Marathon County and that we are a community for all. And it got into uh, themes that we hit at earlier in the show as well. And that is this, this whole notion, this dastardly Alice in Wonderland-esque notion that talking about racism is somehow racist, that trying to address racism in our political maps is somehow racist. And the folks that are pitching this got to understand, you'd better get over this quick because you're not gonna get a moment's peace from the rest of us who understand the need to do the right thing. Well said. Yeah, I agree with you, Pat. I mean, it, it is a common theme. You know, this Supreme Court decision was, uh, was turned around based on a, a crazy reading of, of uh, the Voting Rights Act, uh, which, which was, was passed to help make things more fair for people, uh, for black and brown people around America who, whose voting rights were being suppressed. And, and, and they overturned that. And this Wausau, uh, you know, they got rid of their diversity board. That's the, that's the thing we're talking about. They got rid of their diversity board uh, at the county level, thinking that, that that's going to help issues of diversity or racism in, in Marathon County. And obviously that's not the case. Yeah, they think it makes the problem go away. And it, it doesn't. Um, they said talking about this is divisive. No, it's uncomfortable. And it should be uncomfortable because that's how you solve problems uh, is by confronting things that weren't necessarily your fault, but it is your job to try to make the world a little bit better rather than add to the hostility. So with that, it's time for us to go. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Kirk. Thanks to our guests, Bill Whitford and Jane Rush. And thank you for joining us at the cabin. We hope you come on back up north next week. Watch it, watch it, watch it.